Good evening. I am Nicole Adams, most recently serving as the general chairman of the 69th South Atlantic Regional Conference. This evening, we are very, very happy to bring to you a very informative program on Black Health Matters, sponsored by our South Atlantic Regional Sponsor, ASI and Black Health Matters. Pay attention to the information tonight. I know you've been looking forward to it. We have a great uh, panel here for you this evening. So please enjoy the program. And on behalf of Carolyn G. Randolph, your South Atlantic Regional Director, we welcome you. Leslie? Thank you so much. Thanks, Sora, Nicole, for that warm welcome. And good evening and welcome to all of you viewing from wherever you are, our Black Health Matters family, as well as all members of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Just by being here today, you are joining a very vital conversation about gynecologic health and uterine cancer that impact women around the world, especially women of color. Uterine cancer incidents and mortality rates are on the rise with the highest incidence rates happening in BIPOC communities. Identifying symptoms and seeking help is especially important in our communities where there are significant disparities in healthcare. This program, as Sora Nicole mentioned, is sponsored by ASI, a fully integrated pharmaceutical business focused on human healthcare. You can learn more about this initiative spot her for ec at spot for and you'll learn more about how to help end the silence around endometrial cancer. The initiative is now in its second year. So you're in for a treat. Our guest speakers are the 2020 Atlanta TED Talk speaker, gynecologic oncologist, Dr. Mitzi Ann Davis of Piedmont Healthcare, who will share her knowledge on gynecologic health and endometrial cancer. Dr. Davis is a gynecologic oncologist at Piedmont Fayette Hospital in Fayetteville, Georgia. She has been committed to providing comprehensive cancer care to women, especially on the south side of Metro Atlanta. Dr. Davis serves on several executive committees, including the Clinical Governance for Oncology. She is a leading expert in minimally invasive surgeries, having completed over 600 da Vinci robotic cases to date. She has been the recipient of many accolades and recognitions, including being named top doc from the Georgia Trend Magazine. Dr. Davis is a fellow of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and a member of the Society of Gynecologic Oncologists. She's fluent in Spanish and in her spare time enjoys cooking and traveling with her husband and two children. And then in addition to Dr. Davis, we have Angeline Jackson. She is our patient ambassador. She's an educator in the metropolitan area. Previously, she was an adjunct professor with Greenville Technical College and technology specialist with Cigna Healthcare. Over Jackson's 25 year career, she has a number of teaching, training and general management positions that she's held. Born in Savannah, Georgia, Angeline graduated with a BS in computer science from Savannah State University and a master's from Wilmington University and also an education degree from Nova Southeastern University and is currently pursuing her PhD, so we'll soon call her doctor, in curriculum and instruction. Sara Angeline Jackson is also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Mitzi Ann Davis. Oh, thank you so much, Leslie. Everyone, good evening. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity um, for us to have a great conversation about GYN cancers with a special interest and focus on endometrial cancer. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about all the different um, cancers. <clears throat> As um, Lizzie has um, uh, said earlier, my name is Dr. Mitzan Davis. I'm a German oncologist down at Piedmont Fayette in Fayetteville, Georgia. And I've been there for about six years. 
Um, my passion is education. I used to be a teacher before I went to medical school, and I'm happy that it's something that I still am able to share information, um, especially with my patients and with the community, so that hopefully we reduce the, the rate of people who come to see me. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about, as I said, GYN cancers. And as a GYN oncologist, I am both a surgeon and a medical oncologist. So primarily I do surgery, but I also, if you need chemotherapy, I help to facilitate that and treat that. And normally a lot of times with our GYN cancers, we need to incorporate radiation oncology as well. And I spearhead that and make sure we have a good treatment plan for patients. So... Oh, good. Um, can, um, September is GYN Cancer Awareness Month. And that's the time I normally give this talk to the community in Fayetteville. So if you're in that area, feel free. Normally it's the last Thursday in every September that I normally, and I've been giving this talk now for about four or five years. So overview, we're gonna talk about GYN cancers, um, ovarian, cervical, vulvar, endometrial. You get to meet one of my favorite patients, my personal patient, Miss um, Angeline Jackson, and you get to hear her experience as to, you know, all the different emotions that she went through when she first had her diagnosis and treatment and different things like that. And I'm going to touch a little bit on, survi on survivorship and then questions. So pre-quiz. I always like to, you know, kind of focus where we're going to go with this talk. So things I want you to remember. Uh, question, what is the most common symptom of endometrial cancer? Is it itching, bloating, postmenopausal vaginal bleeding? At the end, you'll be able to tell me. Uh, number two, what is the best surveillance tool for ovarian cancer? Is it tumor markers like C125? And we'll explain that later on. Pelvic ultrasound, CT scans. Or is there no good screening tool? Sec thirdly, how can we prevent cervical cancer? Is it abstinence, um, pap smears, or HPV vaccine? Next, oh, this is not going forward. There we go. Um, what is the most common symptom of vulvar cancer? And I'll talk about that. Is it vaginal bleeding, vulvar itching, feeling a bump, or all the above? And only women over the age of 55 can get gynecologic cancers. Is that true or false? So <clears throat> ovarian cancer. So my population of patients and most G1 oncologists, the most common cancer we're going to treat is endometrial cancer. And that's a cancer that commonly affects a lot of industrialized um, countries. And that's because it's related to obesity. So, uh, so societies and um, that are uh, more um, advanced and have access to a lot of foods will have um, more endometrial cancers. And then the rest of the cases are split between ovarian cancer, maybe like 15 or 20 percent, cervical cancer and vulvar cancer. So ovarian cancer is a cancer that affects the ovaries. And if you can see my little pointer. So this white thing here, that's what the ovaries look like. So when I do laparoscopy or anybody does any surgery, GYN anatomy, you have the uterus hair, um, the uh, <clears throat> fallopian tube back hair and the um, uh, ovary. Uh, the risk for um, ovarian cancer in lifetime is one out of 78. Risk factors include age, okay? Typically happens in 60s and 70s. Um, if you have genetics, a family history of BRCA mutation, which is a genetic mutation that impedes um, or um, prevents DNA repair, that increases your risk of having uh, breast and ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer for males, breast male breast cancer, and um, prostate cancer. Talc, there has been a lot of study before they would say there was no um, relationship with talc and ovarian cancer, but I'm sure everyone has heard the whole um, Johnson & Johnson was sued for quite a bit um, a couple of years ago. And what they found was that talc used to have asbestos and that asbestos can cause inflammation in the, um, in the tubes and that can lead to um, ovarian cancer. We call it the silent killer. And the reason for that is by the time it prevent, it presents, about 70% of the time, it will present at a stage three or four, okay? 
And the reason for that is the symptoms are non-specific. You have bloating, um, uh, changes in your bowel and bladder habits. You're having more gas or you're having constipation. Uh, typically patients, when they come to see me, they look like they're nine months pregnant with twins because their tummy is distended with malignant fluid called ascites, okay? So bloating, weight gain, leg swelling, early satiety, meaning every time you eat a, a little bit of food, you get full. These are the symptoms that patients normally present with. And by the time I um, take them to the OR, the cancer has already spread. Um, the treatment of ovarian cancer. Oh, keep going. There we go. So that's what it looks like. Oh, come back. So that fluid here that you can see, and we can hope you can see my cursor, that's the malignant ascites, okay? That's the fluid that causes all that bloating. And then this little dot that looks like um, oatmeal, that's a, a, a tumor deposit. And I'm moving forward. This is me removing a um, cancer. And this patient was a young patient, about 22. Um, and it was limited to that one ovary. <clears throat> so, Patients who are at increased risk of um, ovarian cancer are patients with first degree relatives, your mother, your sister, your daughter, um, a personal history of breast cancer, especially premenopausal breast cancer. Um, if you have Ashkenazi um, Jewish heritage, um, if two or more close relatives have been diagnosed with breast cancer, make sure you see your um, either your primary care doctor or your GYN, and we can do a simple panel, okay? That panel before it used to just be BRCA, BRCA1 and 2, but no, there's an extensive panel, ATM, BRIP1, RAD51C. The importance of this information is that for patients that have been diagnosed with these hereditary um, genetic mutations, we can offer you risk-reducing surgery. So once you've completed childbearing, we can say, you know, you need to take your ovaries and tubes out, um, sometimes a hysterectomy um, in another disease I'll talk about called Lynch syndrome. So these things are life-saving. You know, if you have information, information is, is important. As G.I. Joe said, knowing is half the battle. Um, for ovarian cancer, there's no screening test. So when patients always say, oh, you know, I should have gotten an ultrasound or CA-125, these are not screening tests. Screening tests are tests that help to pick up the disease in the early stage or a precancerous stage before it gets to a cancer. And unfortunately, doing ultrasounds and C125 will lead to unnecessary surgery. And unnecessary surgery can have severe complications. The reason when you've been diagnosed with an ovarian cancer or a pelvic mass that looks suspicious, you need to see a GYN oncologist. And the reason for that is your life depends on it. Survival is lower if you are not operated on by a GYN oncologist in the first instance. We are trained an extra four years after four years of GYN, of OBGYN residency to do radical surgery. And for ovarian cancer, your survival depends on the ability to remove all visible disease, okay? So I strongly encourage you, if you have a pelvic mass that they found that looks suspicious, go and seek a G1 oncologist. And they can determine and say, you know, it's fine, your GYN can do it. But what you don't want to do is to be subjected to two different surgeries, okay, or an incomplete surgery the first time. Treatment of ovarian cancer, chemotherapy, and surgery. And or the order depends on how the patient presents. So like that picture I showed you with all that ascites, patients that present like that very uncomfortable or they have disease in the liver or too far gone where I can't remove everything, I start with chemotherapy first to shrink things down and then followed by a radical surgery, which typically is a hysterectomy, removing the um, uh, anything that looks like it has a cancer. And sometimes that may um, include removing bowel or um, giving a, a colostomy, which typically is temporary. That's a picture where it's so far extensive that this person, you shouldn't, that person would need chemotherapy to shrink things because we can't remove all this disease. This um, picture here is limited to one ovary that could be resected. Um, the anatomy, GYN anatomy again, uterus, cervix, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. And then you have this apron that's hanging from the transverse colon and the stomach. It's called the omentum. 
The reason for the omentum is the omentum is rudimentary. It's not really necessary, but it adds extra packing. But cancer cells love that fatty tissue, and it's a part of our staging operation. So we typically remove it. Also, sometimes we may need to remove some lymph nodes, okay? And that will also determine the stage and with stage prognosis. And this is oh, Dr. Coretta Cotts Scott King, who unfortunately died from ovarian cancer. Next, cervical cancer. So cervical cancer is one of the only cancers that there is a vaccine to prevent this cancer, okay? This vaccine starts at ages nine up to 45, okay? A lot of GYNs don't know that our primary care doctors that they extended before it would stop at 26, but they extended it up to 45 about five years ago. So I have a lot of patients who are like, oh, well, I already have HPV. Regardless of exposure, prior exposure to HPV, you are entitled to having this um, uh, vaccine. So we, unfortunately, I think I see way too much HPV related cancers in this day and age where you have a, where you have a, a vaccine. Unfortunately, this is a disease that will disproportionately affect very young women, okay? And so that's why it's important, one, to not only get vaccinated, but there's also a whole prevention program. It's called the pap smear. So people always say, well, you know, how comes I have endometrial cancer or ovarian cancer? I had a normal pap smear. Pap smears are only designed to pick up abnormal cells on the cervix, okay? And pap smears have gone through a myriad of changes every couple years or so there's something new. Having said that, they have now extended the year of initiation for pap smears up to 25. Before it was once within three years of having sexual intercourse and then they moved it to 21 and now they have it to 25. Um, it's co-testing that we have here in the States which means a pap smear and HPV testing. There are other places in the world that they just go with HPV testing because that is the precursor. HPV is a precursor of cervical cancer, okay? Um, again, vaccination, okay? Um, from age <clears throat> 11 up to 45, sometimes they start at nine. Getting regular pap smears, which is typically not, it's not at two years old, sorry, at two, every, every two years, that's a little typo, sorry. But um, every three to five years, you can get pap smears, okay? And starting at 25 now. Uh, cervical cancer, okay, if, if it's early, can be treated either with um, a very, very simple, a simple hysterectomy with the robotic uh, da Vinci system. And it has to be very, very early, okay? But if there's any visible disease there, then you have to have an open radical surgery. Now, um, minimally invasive approach really has revolutionized uh, uh, cancer surgeries. You know, before patients used to stay in the hospital for two weeks, big open incisions. Now we're able to do a lot of surgeries with very small incisions, same day procedure, uh, faster recovery, less pain. The only disease where it's not applicable is advanced cervical cancer. When you do a minimally invasive approach, it increases the risk of this cancer coming back and um, patients dying from it. So minimally invasive approach is no longer recommended for early cervical cancer. We typically do an open radical hysterectomy, which is about four hours. You have to go home with a Foley catheter because we do a lot of dissection and the, the nerves that feed the bladder get um, disrupted, which is why you have to have that Foley catheter in. As opposed to like a simple hysterectomy that you normally get for um, fibroids or something, which is normally same day procedure, small incisions, you go home without any issues. Sometimes it's too far gone and I have to start with, I have to um, offer chemotherapy and radiation, and patients are not candidates for um, uh, surgery. So please, 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 there is a whole HPV vaccine, even if you've been exposed to HPV. Smoking is another thing that increases the risk of HPV um, uh, permeation. So if you're a smoker and you have HPV, they go hand in hand. And so HPV can affect head and neck cancers, anal cancer, vaginal, vulvar cancer, cervical cancer, okay? That's me doing surgery and no robot for that one. 
And then I always like to give, uh, normally when I'm uh, in a live crowd, I always like to give a little trivia. Henrietta Lacks. So Henrietta Lacks is a famous for her cells. Her cells really had, um, have uh, been able to revolutionize uh, uh, medical research. It's called HeLa cells, and they came from her cervical cancer. And it was the first um, type of human cells that were able to be cultured in the lab. And it has led to the eradication of um, or help to um, facilitate HIV research. And personally, I've done research on HeLa cells for my, when I was in fellowship. Vulvar cancer. So vulvar cancer is a cancer that typically affects older women, okay? And typically at the point where either they have a caretaker or they're caring by themselves. But of course, if you know anybody who's over the age of 80 years old, they're still very modest. You don't really know what's going on. And by the time they come to me, they're like, yeah, I've been having pain, you know, in my vulvar area or itching. Um, uh, age, women over 65, HPV again is one of these precursors of this cancer. Smoking, again, HPV and smoking. If you have HPV and you're a smoker, stop smoking. Lichen sclerosis, which is a dermatitis that affects the skin and it can cause itching, okay? If you're having prolonged itching down there, this is abnormal. Please to seek your, your, your either PCP or your GYN to make sure you get a simple biopsy in the office. Vulvar cancer, typically, if it's early, can be treated with surgery. Sometimes I may have to resect the entire vulva. So these are, this is the labia majora, the lips, um, the urethra, the um, clitoris, the anus is sometimes very close by. Um, most of the times we're able to remove these things. Sometimes patients may need flaps because the defect is so large. Sometimes we may have to sample lymph nodes as well. That will determine if they need chemotherapy after. Um, the surgery is um, about three or four hours. Most of the time it's just to reconstruct the vagina, the vulva, to make sure it looks exactly how I found it the first time, minus the tumor. So now we get to endometrial cancer. So endometrial cancer, as I had alluded to and mentioned before, it's a cancer that typically affects high income countries, okay? And that's because of the abundance of food. Um, and when you have extra fat cells, when you're overweight, you have extra fat cells, the fat cells convert to estrogen. And that estrogen thickens the lining of that uterus, okay? The incidence of endometrial cancer is increasing, okay? It is more common amongst white women, actually, but the death rate is higher in black women. So this whole slide, if you don't hear anything, here are these really devastating statistics. High mortality rate, okay, in black women, 80% higher than white women. Lower five-year survival rates, 85 versus 66%. Most likely when patients present to me, they already have advanced stage or more aggressive type of tumors, okay, what we call high grade. Less likely to be offered surgical treatment, okay? Either they're too far gone or where, where they are, especially if they're in a, a, a urban setting or a low income setting, that they're less likely to be offered minimal in invasive surgery. Robotic surgery is standard of care. If you go, if you have an endometrial cancer and you go to a physician that's not offering you robotic surgery, unless your uterus is very large, you need to seek a second opinion. This is standard of care. Uh, of care. Minimally invasive surgery is what we typically offer. Um, less likely to be offered a combination of vaginal brachytherapy and external beam radiation. These are different types of radiation. So external beam, EBRT radiation is where we target the pelvis. And vaginal brachytherapy is where we just give you just the top of the vagina. The difference is with external beam, that's five weeks of treatment, typically 25 fractions. So 25 times you have to get radiation, whereas vaginal brachytherapy is three to five treatments, just once a week or so. And also less likely to participate in clinical trials. And we need to participate in clinical trials because there's sometimes that there are certain genetics that we have that can be targeted. But if we're not included in these clinical trials then we don't know, or we don't know if there are better drugs for, you, um, for, for us than opposed to somebody else. So the signs, <coughs> symptom, the signs of endometrial cancer, 
postmenopausal vaginal bleeding, all right? This is the hallmark. If you're over 50 or 55, whenever, if you haven't had a period for greater than 12 months, you are menopausal, okay? And if you start to have any vaginal bleeding, spotting, abnormal discharge, go and get it checked out. If you are younger than that and you're premenopausal, start and you're still having periods. If you're having heavy vaginal bleeding, this again is abnormal. Sometimes in our community, we normalize heavy vaginal bleeding. It is not normal. Get it checked out, okay? Obesity, as I said, increases your risk by if being five BMI units over the normal, increases your risk by 50% to get endometrial cancer. Other things that can increase your risk include genetics. So I spoke about the genetics in ovarian cancer. Well, there's a, gen a, gene, um, uh, a gene defect called Lynch syndrome. And it's again, it's a defect in DNA repair that can increase your risk of not only endometrial cancer, but colon cancer. Those are the two most common ones. And other cancers that are associated with that Lynch syndrome include ovarian cancer, about 10%, breast cancer, GI cancer, small bowel as well, um, some brain cancer, some skin cancer. So it's a whole um, uh, syndrome. Patients who have a strong family history of pre, like before 50 colon cancer or early endometrial cancer, you need to get to a genetic counselor. Because if you have this gene, then again, we can offer you risk reducing surgery. Once you've completed childbearing, or if you decide you don't want children, we can offer you a hysterectomy and removing tubes and ovaries, okay? Drugs, if you are a breast cancer survivor, um, uh, tamoxifen, okay? Tamoxifen, you normally see on it for five years. Um, oh, back. Is it going back? Now we'll go back. Good. Tamoxifen, that increases its uh, what we call a serum. So not only does it block estrogen, but sometimes it can also secrete estrogen and can cause a thickening in the lining of the uterus. So super important that you, if you have that, that you're doing an ultrasound, if you have any bleeding, that you get checked out. Endometrial cancer can be diagnosed in the office by a simple endometrial office biopsy, okay? It takes literally about two seconds. It's not the most comfortable. It's a big, it's like a big strong contraction, but it like it's done in two seconds and we can have our um, answer. If there is a huge, if there's still a clinical indication or um, intuition that something is going on despite it being negative, then your provider needs to take you to the OR and do what we call a DNC a dilation and curatage, okay? So you go in and give a good scrape. There are two types of endometrial cancers. There's type one endometroid. This is the one that is associated with obesity. It typically is in um, very indolent, slow growing and easily treatable with a hysterectomy. If you're gonna get a GYN cancer, endometrial cancer is the one to get because it typically is easily treatable with a hysterectomy. Very rarely do you need chemotherapy or radiation. Then you have the type two. The type twos are not associated with um, obesity. These are the more aggressive types. These are the types that when we find them, when you're diagnosed, they unfortunately have a higher risk of spreading already in the lymph nodes, sometimes in the lung, sometimes in the liver will need to get chemotherapy, even if it's at an early stage, a stage one, you still need chemotherapy because of the aggressive nature. I spoke to the other symptoms I wanted to um, point out, postmenopausal bleeding, we mentioned that already, um, thickened endometrial stripe on pelvic ultrasound. Sometimes patients are like, you know, I just have a pain here and you went to your GYN, you don't ignore it. Listen to your body. Go and get it checked out. Even if it's completely normal, you have peace of mind because sometimes they might do an ultrasound and you haven't started having any bleeding, but that lining is thickened. And when you're postmenopausal, it should be four millimeters or less. Anything above that, it needs to be checked out. Sometimes it may just be a, a benign polyp, but you never know. Go and get it checked out, okay? Treatment for endometrial cancer, complete hysterectomy. You're removing the uterus, cervix, um, bilateral salpinga oophorectomy. It's a fancy word for saying removing your tubes and ovaries, and also sampling the lymph nodes. So the lymph nodes, no, we don't, before we used to remove all the lymph nodes, that would increase your risk of lymphedema, 
needing a compression stocking, we hardly ever do that, no. There's something called sentinel lymph node, which is where we remove just the mother lymph node of the entire um, uh, bed. So we can get the information that we need. In endometrial cancer, removing lymph nodes is just for diagnosis, meaning who are the patients that will benefit if you have cancer that's found that in your lymph nodes, these patients benefit from chemotherapy. That's the number one reason we want to make sure, especially in a high-grade cancer or a cancer that is more advanced. Uh, radiation and chemotherapy, as I said, sometimes we need to do that. Uh, here's a picture again of the uterus cervix. This is the lymph nodes along here. Moving forward, uh, these are the different types that way we can do surgery. Um, a laparotomy, which is our traditional midline incision. Um, I have to do that sometimes with big, large ovarian masses, but for the most part, I am the busiest um, robotic surgeon on the south side of Atlanta. So we do mostly everything minimally invasive because patients do much better. You have your downtime is two weeks, my oldest patient that I operated on, she's 95 now. I did her surgery, which was 90 or 91, and was back to having tea with her friends the following week. That's the beauty of minimally invasive surgery. You don't have that much pain, faster recovery, and it's in 3D, so we get to see everything that we can see, even sometimes better than, than open surgery. All right, that's me at the robot. That's our old robot. That's our newer robot. And so the robot has a console. That's me in the corner. And then the arms are in the patient. Next picture. And that's what it looks like. That very small um, uterus. Sometimes if it's small, sometimes it's larger than that. But you can see the uterus, cervix, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. And that's what the patient looks like. So I did all of that with these teeny incisions. Um, chemotherapy in um, GYN cancers, the main one we normally use, carboplatin and paclitaxel. Some of those side effects include losing your hair, um, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, bone marrow suppression, meaning every time we get chemo, we have to make sure that your red blood cells are, are adequate, white blood cells, platelets, we have to check that all the time. You know, in chemotherapy in GYN has really gone through so many changes last, I would say three or four years. We do a lot of immunotherapy, a lot of targeted therapy. Whenever we operate on patients, we, um, as soon as one of the first things we do, we co um, coordinate with the pathologist, we send it for molecular profiling. This is called precision medicine, okay? We can target whatever defect your tumor has, we can target it with different treatments. So it's not just, you know, back in the day where you just have this one chemotherapy. We really try and say, okay, what is the best treatment for this patient? And of course, this is Gwen Afwell, who unfortunately died from endometrial cancer. But now you get to meet my um, patient, Miss Angeline Jackson. Welcome, Angeline, Miss Jackson. Hi. How are you doing? Fine. Happy to be here. Oh, I'm so happy that you're able to be here. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, you know, the same questions that I've asked you before, you know, please describe to me, you know, what were your symptoms before and what prompted you to go to your GYN before you, you came to see me? Okay, what's well, my routine exam? The only time I had ever missed was during the pandemic year. And I think the only symptom that I had, you know, learning now after you becoming my doctor, there was some abnormal bleeding, I believe, but I had never had a full year where my cycle had just stopped. I had never experienced that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think much about it. And before I can even tell the doctor, when I got to my GYN, she did my exam and right there, she detected that there was some type of polyp. Okay. And um, I asked, was that normal? And she said, well, yeah, it's, it's okay, but we'll test everything. And get back with you, you know, good or bad. That's what we do. So I said, okay, I didn't think anything about it. And I got a call within two days and I went in again. I didn't think anything. I'm thinking, you know, I'm anemic. I need blood again. I don't know. Didn't think cancer. And she told me the polyp, it was cancer there. And I'm thinking like, how did I get this? You know, I, I come to the doctor every year and she said it happens, but you know, we're going to send you out and get everything taken care of. And I think for maybe two or three days, I was so nervous. And then I got the call from your office to come in and I did so. And I 
a lot of tests were done and um, you met with me and you talked me through everything and that made me feel better. I think when I really felt the best, the emotions kind of calmed down. I was off of Google. It's after you got the test results and you told me everything and you said, we can beat this. You're going to be okay. And that was the first time, you know, I really felt like God, my prayers are being answered. You know, I got a name for this cancer now. I don't have to look at Google. I'm just trusting in this doctor and we're going to get it done. But uh, just going through it was like a whirlwind. I just wondered, you know, did I get it when I thought overall I was healthy? I was doing the right thing, mm -hmm. keeping up with my appointments. But uh, it really drove me crazy for the first three days. I stayed on Google and I think that's the worst thing to do. Don't turn to Google. Just wait until you get what you're supposed to get. But um, the emotions, it was really horrible. I couldn't talk to anyone about it. My kids were getting, well, one of my son was getting ready to go off to college. And I just thought my life was over. And when I got the call from you after meeting you, and then I got that call and you really told me, and I was already looking on my chart. Anything that hit, I was looking at my chart. Not that I understood everything, but when you called and you said and talked to me, and I remember that. It was about six o'clock in the evening, and that made the difference for me. Uh, and, you know, and um, what's very common with endometrial cancer, if you have what we call the run of the mill endometrial cancer, most patients are going to be just fine. Okay, this cancer, you're not going to die from it. You're, it's the recurrence rate is very low, about two to four percent. And actually, most patients don't die from a recurrence of their disease, but they die from obesity related complications, heart disease and diabetes. So I always encourage my patients, especially my heavier patients, that, you know, I know we're all in the struggle of losing weight, but it's super important to get on a good weight management. And um, the, the risk of it coming back, as I said, is two to four percent. So most, most patients, as I said, if you're going to get a GYN cancer, this is the one to get because it typically is easily treatable with a hysterectomy. Do you have any other advice for them going through that same process? Like, you know, what what um, information sites um, you found helpful or anything like that? One thing that I did find very helpful um, with your office, I was put with a nutritionist, so I eat a whole lot better. Yes, and that was in, uh, I can even go exercise anytime I like, and that's like a lifetime thing. So I, that's really good. I, I think for me, I had to be more educated, and I'm one of those really modest patients. I, I don't say certain things. I'm thinking like, oh, no, it's nothing, but um, I kind of dealt with uh, having uh, surgeries, getting um, fibroids removed over and over. And I was told about eight years ago to get everything removed. Mm -hmm. But I kind of went through that. Well, I don't want a hysterectomy. I'm too young for that. Mm -hmm. But I went through a lot of things then, even conceiving my kids. I didn't do that very naturally. So mm -hmm. I, I would say, no matter how small it is, talk to your doctor. Don't, don't be ashamed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, share your experiences with other people. You never know what they're going through. Absolutely. So those are the two things that I would say. Talk to your doctor, no matter how small it is, mm -hmm. or just share your experiences with other people. Yes, That's please. That's been very helpful for me. Whatever you do, if you have postmenopausal bleeding and you tell your friend and your friend, oh, that happened to me. That's normal. It's not normal, guys. It's abnormal. Get it checked out. Okay. Talk to your friends about the information that you learned today, because it can save. I've had so many guys, I've been doing this for uh, here in Atlanta for six years, but doing this talk for about four or five years. And inevitably I'll have somebody in my office and was like, I was on one of these talks that I don't get to see your faces, you know, and I heard it and I came in and I got checked out. Okay. And if that's that one life saved, I have done my job. Okay. So please, please, please. Thank you so much. I wanted to, uh, let's see, take home message. Postmenopausal vaginal bleeding is abnormal. Seek medical attention. I cannot say it enough. Okay. Um, other cancers that I treat, vaginal cancer, which again is another HPV um, cancer, primary peritoneal cancer. We group it into fallopian tube cancer and ovarian cancers. Those we treat the same way, surgery and chemotherapy, the order of which really depends on how the patient presents. Um, I always put this in. So how patients come to me, 
either you go to your GI doctor, especially if with ovarian cancer patients, they are having this, those symptoms I described, feeling full faster, bloating, and I think it's just GI. So a lot of times I go to the GI doctor to do a colonoscopy, a CT scan, and there's a lot of fluid, a large pelvic mass, and that's how they come to me. Uh, OBGYN, that's my largest referral base. You go to your doctor for pelvic pain, they did an ultrasound, you had a cyst or postmenopausal bleeding, they did an endometrial biopsy, came back as a cancer, med -onc or the ER. Sometimes patients have acute pain and they go to the ER and find that they have these huge masses and then that's how they come to see me. Um, first consultation, which I think is always the hardest, right? Because, you know, you've been, first of all, anybody who tells you have to see an oncologist, everybody's thinking the worst. And so I purposely don't wear a white coat. If you come to my office, I don't because it just sends up the anxiety even more. So I try and just calm everybody down. You are going to be fine. Whatever we do, we're here to treat you aggressively. And we talk about your treatment plan, the risk and benefits of what the plan I have offered. Most of the times patients are going to need surgery when they come to see me. Um, and then once, whatever, when I do surgery, we send it to the pathologist and they have to look at it under the microscope. And that result will take five to seven business days, okay? And the answer is going to be either we can observe, okay, we don't need to do anything else. Um, the risk of it coming back is low or it's not even a cancer that can happen. Or sometimes you may need chemotherapy, radiation, a combination of both. And then during treatment, you know, patients who are going through, sometimes I think we kind of gloss over this side. But, you know, there are a lot of times, you know, when you get diagnosed with that cancer, you're so focused on, okay, chemo appointment to next chemo appointment. And sometimes we don't really focus on the symptoms and, and the emotions that you're feeling. And those are valid, you know, the depression, the family support, patients who have, um, who are poor are not going to do well. This is documented. Like ASCO, the ASCO is going on this week. That's the medical oncologist. And it is documented because of all the stress that you have to think about, how am I going to eat? How am I going to pay for gas? How am I going to pay for rent? That you can't even focus on your, um, on your cancer treatments. And I've seen that a lot, that patients can't show up because they don't have transportation. And so all those things, I always tell patients, let me focus on the medicine part. I can focus on what chemotherapy to give you, what drug to give you, but the mental stuff, having a good support, all of that, I cannot do. You have to have that good support system around you, okay? And that is equally important in cancer treatment. Weight loss, hair loss, all those different things. I always encourage patients, your life is your story, okay? Write well and edit often. And, uh, you know, survivorship is very important. A lot of times you have a lot of side effects from the treatments that we've given you. Um, radiation, radiation changes sexual function, okay? Sometimes the vagina can get shorter. If you're not using a dilator, which is not the most comfortable thing that you have to do at least three times a week for at least the first two years, especially when you've had pelvic radiation, if not, the vagina gets very, very short like that. And then it's not functional. So all those different things, if you're, you know, young or old, if you're sexually active, cancer treatment can change those things. Your libido, you know, the skin, all those different things, surgical complications, lymphedema, you know, different things having to wear compression stockings all the time. There's no good treatment for that. Um, so it's important that, you know, when we talk about survivorship, it's not just, yes, I survived a cancer, but we want you to be thriving, okay? We want you to know that you're a survivor, that you're enjoying your life. And we try and coordinate with the primary care doctor, your medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, and myself. The typical surveillance for GYN cancers is every three months for the first two years. And that's because if it comes back, it tends to come back within the first two years. Um, and then every six months after two to five years and then annually. And I love to give graduations. That's, I'm big on that in my office. You know, it's like, guess what? You're at every six months now. And, you know, patients are so overjoyed because once you're old at two-year mark, very low risk for that cancer to come back. Um, 
at Piedmont, I have to put a plug in for Piedmont Fayette. We have a great cancer wellness center there. And we have a big one at the um, Pinewood Studio. It's not Pinewood Studios anymore, Trillith Studio. But they have a state-of-the-art gym. We have a nutritionist with the program, exercise, super sexual health counselor. You know, So we have a lot of different um, resources down at Piedmont Fayette. So post quiz, hopefully you guys were listening. What is the most common symptom of endometrial cancer? I hope you guys know postmenopausal vaginal bleeding, okay? Or heavy vaginal bleeding if you're premenopausal, get an endometrial biopsy. What's the best surveillance tool for ovarian cancer? There's none, okay? Um, doing tumor markers in CA125, these are not good screening tools. They don't pick up the cancer at a precancer stage. They pick it up typically when it's already there, when it's already advanced. And how can we prevent cervical cancer? There's an HPV vaccine. Uh, next, uh, what's the most common symptom of vulvar cancer? Vaginal bleeding or vulvar bleeding, vulvar itching and feeling a bump, all of the above. Get a biopsy, okay? Sometimes I, I'm in some of these groups where the dermatologists are just treating lichen sclerosis and without you know getting a biopsy, make sure you get a biopsy, okay? Because sometimes lichen sclerosis is a precancer, is a pre uh, precancerous lesion for vulvar cancer, okay? And only women over the age of 55, you can get can gynecologic cancers? Absolutely not. Can happen to patients who are younger, okay? So questions. Thank you guys so much. I always enjoy. Yes. Go ahead. So I'm going to come off mute now. Hi, everyone. Um, we have quite a few questions here. Okay. And oh my gosh, there's a it, lot. I will there, try to um, answer or question, use, um, ask Dr. Davis as many questions as we can. We also have, if your question's not answered, you can actually send an email to info at blackhealthmatters.com. And then we will also attempt to answer your questions from there, your individual question. So the first question that I'm seeing up here, I'm trying to look, okay. Um, here's a question from a person. Is your past sexual history a precursor to ovarian or cervical cancer? Uh, not to ovarian cancer, but cervical cancer is HPV. So HPV is human papillomavirus, and that is a sexually transmitted infection. It's the most common sexually, admitted, um, sexually transmitted infection. So I always tell patients, if you've had sex a half a time or 5,000 times, it doesn't matter. Most of the times, your body is able to clear this virus between within nine to 12 months. But unfortunately, there's a five to 10% of the population that can't clear this virus. These are the patients who are smokers, who are immunocompromised, either HIV or renal transplant, lupus, whatever it is that they're taking some sort of um, immunosuppression. Um, uh, and those are the patients that can't clear this HPV and it gets incorporated into the vulva, that's the outside, the vagina, the cervix, for men, head and neck, that's the most common HPV cancer, anal, um, the um, anal um, cavity as well. So sexual history, more so related to um, uh, cervical cancers and well, uh, vaginal cancer, all the HPV cancers. Okay. And then the next question here is, should women ask for HPV testing in addition to women's health test panels, or is it standard here in the States? It's standard here. Co-testing is standard here. Because as I said, HPV is the um, uh, in, um, indicator to um, increase your risk of having a cervical cancer. So if you have an abnormal pap smear, but HPV negative, then we typically just kind of ignore that because HPV is the, is the prognostic factor. Okay, and then our next question here is, understanding correlation doesn't imply causation. Is there a correlation between PCOS and gynecological cancers? So what general advice do you have for women? Okay, so PCOS is where you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, okay? So it's a syndrome. So a lot of these patients, unfortunately, have um, diabetes or insulin resistance, um, overweight, and as I said, obesity can increase your risk of endometrial cancer because having extra uh, fat, adipose tissue fatty cells can convert to estrogen, okay? So it by itself is not, but it's the syndrome that causes that um, increased risk of having um, endometrial cancer. Okay, and here's another question. 
Do you recommend a hysterectomy if you're positive for BRCA2 mutation or is a bilateral sumpingo ophrectomy sufficient? That's a great question. So as I alluded to or spoke to you guys before, there's a BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. BRCA1, typically we recommend doing risk-reducing removal of tubes and ovaries. This is the BRCA mutation that increases your risk of not only breast, but ovarian cancer. And taking out the ovaries reduces your risk of breast cancer by 70%. Now BRCA1 is earlier. We typically recommend 35 to 40. BRCA2 typically presents a little later, 40 to 45. The question is, okay, we already know we have to get the tubes and ovaries out, but do you have to get your, your uterus out at the same time? Well, there's a theoretical risk, about 3%, that you can also have a high-grade endometrial cancer. It's not NCCN recommended because there's not sufficient data to recommend that. But for some for patients, I always talk to them about that, that there is this theoretical risk that you can increase your risk of having a high-grade endometrial cancer, and if you want to do that at the same time. Okay, here's another question. If you had a full hysterectomy, should you still get pap smears? Should you get the HPV vaccine still within the age range for HPV vaccine? Okay, great question. If you have, it depends on the indication for your hysterectomy. So if you had a hysterectomy for benign reasons, AKA fibroids, heavy bleeding, and you never had any cervical dysplasia, you do not need to have any more pap smears. However, if your indication for having a hysterectomy is abnormal cells on the cervix, then you need to be monitored before it was 20 years, but now that they revised it about two years ago, it's now 25 years that you still need to do pap smears. And the reason for that is one, HPV cancers or associated cancers are slow growing, so we need to watch you. And two, we can that HPV can show up in the vagina. So even though we've removed the uterus and the cervix, it can show up in the vagina. So that's why you still need pap smears. Unfortunately, I always say HPV is a gift that keeps on giving. Okay. And yes, you can make sure if you're still within the um, age range of the um, vaccine, please get the vaccine. And here's another question. Are Black women more susceptible to have PCO? I haven't seen any data on that. Okay. Next question is, why is mortality higher in Black women when compared to other racial groups? Are we waiting to seek help, prolonging a diagnosis, or appropriate medical treatment? That's a great question. Thank you, um, Christian Savage. It's multifactorial. It's not just socioeconomic. There's some, um, Sloan Kettering is doing a pilot program on trying to figure out these, these uh, um, disparities. There's some genetic component and we are yet to unravel um, that, um, but it's not just socioeconomic. And also, as I said, I think in our community, we normalize heavy vaginal bleeding and that is delaying, you know, we just think it's normal and that's delaying or um, a diagnosis or delaying seeking um, uh, help so that we can intervene um, sooner. <clears throat> so here's another one. Does endometrial ablation play any part in reducing risk for these cancers? Uh, no, endometrial cancer is just a treatment of bleeding. So even if you, if there's something growing, despite having an endometrial ablation, you can still present with postmenopausal bleeding. The risk factors, as I said, for like endometrial cancer, obesity, age, uh, exposure to radiation, genes, um, and um, drugs like tamoxifen. What age may one stop getting PAPs? Great question. Age 65 unless you have had a hysterectomy for cervical dysplasia, or if you've had a history of cervical dysplasia, those abnormal cells, you need to be monitored for at least 25 years, okay? But age 65 is typically what ACOG says. ACOG is, is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Okay, and can you also explain the symptoms of PCOS? Yeah, some of the symptoms of PCOS um, you can have insulin resistance. Um, you have a um, uh, periods, meaning that you go for long, long times without having a period. And then you have all this buildup in your uterus and you have a big, heavy period. A lot of patients have hirsutism that's um, here under the chin, um, uh, obesity. Um, again, um, those are different things and difficulty in getting pregnant. And the reason for that is you're not ovulating every month. Okay. So that lining is getting thicker. 
Mm. If you have fibroids in the uterus, can that turn into cancer and should you have a hysterectomy? No patient is past the childbearing age and postmenopause. Okay, great question. So fibroids will be benign 99.9% .9 of the time, okay? However, sometimes it can turn into a cancer, but this is very, very rare. The, some of the symptoms include, sometimes it's kind of misnomer, rapidly dividing fibroid, like it was two centimeters one month, three months down the road is 10 centimeters. Things that are growing fast, especially when you're postmenopausal, that's completely abnormal. Fibroids is only an issue when you're premenopausal because it is responding to your hormones that are working. When you're postmenopausal, your ovaries are not giving off estrogen and progesterone anymore, okay? And not because you have fibroids mean that you have a surgery. There's so many, there are a whole bunch of different treatments for fibroids. One, number one, if it's not bothering you, leave it alone, okay? Because it's a benign process. If you're having heavy bleeding, you wanna make sure you have an endometrial biopsy and you have a plethora of treatments short of surgery. Surgery is the last case scenario. So you can try hormones, you can try Lupron, which is like a medical menopause. You can try UAE, uterine artery embolization. That's where we cut off the blood supply and they can do this. This is not even a surgery, it's just an outpatient procedure with the interventional radiologist. So not because you have fibroids, you need surgery, okay? Unless it's bothering you. That's when you need to get to take get it um, taken care of. And okay. sorry, and just to piggyback on the fibroids, you don't always have to have open surgery. It just depends on how big. Sometimes they get really, really big. Um, some people are able to do this. You have a lot of a complex GYNs out there um, that do um, uh, robotic surgery. So have small incisions, faster recovery. Okay. Great. If you are diagnosed with HPV, when does it change to cervical cancer? How often you will need a pap? How often will you need a pap test with HPV? Great question. On average, from HPV infection to invasive cervical cancer is about 20 years. So this is very slow growing. And that's why we have pap smears, right? To help pick up these changes. Normally you have these abnormal precancerous changes, what we call CIN, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, CIN 1, 2, and 3. 2 and 3, we normally treat with something called a LEAP procedure or cone biopsy, remove those abnormal cells. And if you have completed childbearing, we can do a hysterectomy. Um, but um, typically it takes a little while before it gets to invasive cancer. And pap smears and pap tests, again, typically start at age 25 before it was at age 21. We do co-testing, which means pap smears. Okay, look at the cells and HPV co-testing. If you have a negative pap smear and a negative HPV, your risk of getting a cervical cancer is very low. And they have stretched out that um, uh, uh, um, screening to every five years. Okay. Some people feel that probably is a little long, but those are the recommendations every three to five years. Okay. So we're running a little low on time, but I'll try to get at least two or three more here. Okay. This one is fibroids are usually accompanied by prolonged menstrual bleeding. If one also experiences ovarian, ovarian dysfunction, how can she distinguish the symptoms mentioned for the gynecologic cancers? Yeah, so even with fibroids, even though you can have abnormal bleeding, you can still get that checked out. So we don't just chalk it up to always oh, just a fibroid. You know, you should definitely, especially if you have risk factors, aka being overweight, you need to get an endometrial biopsy. Um, and you need to go to your doctor. So it's simple. It's the first thing they can do is a simple um, pelvic ultrasound. Okay, pelvic ultrasound would show if you have enlarged ovaries, if you have um, a, a lining that is um, thickened, um, that looks abnormal, if the cervix looks abnormal, you can start with something very simple like that. But don't just chalk it up to, oh, I have fibroids, I'm supposed to be bleeding. You have treatment. Don't, guys, don't sit there and bleeding heavy every month. You have anemia, you need a blood transfusion. This is not normal, okay? Get help. Yeah, definitely. Um, here's a question for you, uh, Dr. Davis. Do you specialize in balancing hormones? I don't, I'm sorry. As a Jew and oncologist, I just focus on oncology, but you have a lot of people in my area that do the compound um, uh, hormones. I, I don't do any of that, so I can't even speak on it. 
Okay, and I can answer probably two more. What are your thoughts on tubal ligation for women who are done having children? That's actually, tubal ligation reduces your risk of ovarian cancer. And thank you, that's a great question, um, Crystal Leach. What we found with the BRCA mutation um, um, population is that, you know what? Ovarian cancer actually starts at the end of the tube. So when we, um, when you did tubal ligations and we interrupted that blood supply, that reduced your risk of ovarian cancer. No, we take out the entire tube. We don't even tie the tubes anymore. We remove the tubes. Leslie, so, this is Nicole, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we still got quite a few people on. And if Dr. Mitzi and you don't mind, we can take another uh, 10 minutes if you'd like to try to get through the question. Sure. Okay, sure. we'll do that. I appreciate You're it. Okay. Sure. okay, great. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Davis, for sure. Um, so here's another question. Can vaginal cancer cause a frequent discharge instead of bleeding? If so, what is the treatment? Yeah, sometimes it can present with some uh, vaginal discharge. The treatment for vaginal cancer, if it's very early, less than two centimeters at the top of the vagina, okay, or sometimes it's right beside the cervix if you still have a cervix, we can do what we call a radical vaginectomy, which we take a portion of the vagina, almost like a radical hysterectomy if you still have a uterus. Um, however, if it's lower down in the vagina, to get clear margins, the vagina is in between the bladder and the rectum, and to get clear margins is, is virtually impossible. So if it's greater than two centimeters or not at the top of the vaginal apex, then unfortunately you have to get radiation and chemotherapy. So what is your opinion of the use of synthetic estrogen and or progesterone versus bioidentical hormones in perimenopausal and menopausal women to reduce symptoms? Okay, so I'm so as an oncologist, this is not my area, just want to say, and I am a little um biased, right? Because I see patients that have, for whatever reason, they had um unopposed estrogen. Remember, we spoke about fat cells turn to estrogen. You can get estrogen from taking, you know, oral estrogen that somebody forgot to put you on progesterone as well. And that increases your risk of having an endometrial cancer. Now, having said that. There's some patients that really need have or, you know, have really, really bad symptoms of menopause and they can't, you know, they're ready to kill their significant other. They can't relate to the children. And for those patients, I always, and I, I, my friend said to me, I treat it like, like an oncologist, but I normally start with over-the-counter um, supplements, black cohosh, even primrose oil. For some people it works, you know, they're phytoestrogens. They act like estrogen, but they're not. Um, other thing that I try is Effexor. It's an antidepressant medication, not because you're depressed, but because it helps to treat those vasomotor symptoms. And then for patients who really can't deal, then I give them the lowest dose of hormone, shortest period. Period. And some people need that, but I uh, I can't really speak to the other um, formulation because that's not my practice. I just really stick to the oncology part. Makes sense. So mm -hmm. next question is, my sister died from ovarian cancer. I'm sorry to hear that. I am 75 years old. Should I see a GYN doctor? Um. Uh, well, sometimes, you know, I'm not quite sure what at 75 years old, people might say, oh, it's not genetic because she was older. But sometimes, you know, BRCA mutation, some people, not all people will have a cancer to have a BRCA mutation. So you definitely can see a genetic counselor. That's where I would start. And with a genetic counselor, they can just do a buccal swab after they ask your history and to see if you are, are at increased risk of getting um, any of these GYN hereditary malignancies. So is there a risk of cancer for a woman taking progesterone only with an intact uterus? No, it's the, the progesterone is protectant against that. As a matter of fact, that's one of, for patients who are very frail, they can't take surgery or they can't take chemotherapy and they have an advanced endometrial cancer, giving them megase, which is a progesterone, is one of our treatments, which has up to a 37 response rate. So we use megase and progesterone a lot in the treatment of endometrial cancers. Very good. So this is another que question I am, or a statement. I am, cer cervical, I am a cervical cancer survivor, th three years clear, just graduated to six months surveillance. Other than my surveillance pap smears, are there any other tests should I be asking for? Should I get the HPV vaccine? Um, so 
the HPV vaccine for you, probably, you know, you have already had cervical cancers. So it's not going to be um, uh, super helpful. Uh, pap smears, we only do once a year. So you're doing the right thing every six months. And nope, you don't need to ask for anything else. We only do CT scans only if you're feeling symptoms. Okay, so we really have moved away from doing these routine CT scans every three months. All those things just increase your risk of uh, ex additional exposure to radiation without um, the added benefit of detecting any early recurrence. Typically, if you have a recurrence in cervical cancer, you have symptoms. So you're doing the right thing. Every six months, they do a pap smear once a year um, and they do a pelvic exam, okay? If you had a hysterectomy and you kept your ovaries, what are the chances of getting ovarian cancer? And then there's a second part to this. What are your views of HRT pellets? Okay, so the HRT and the pellets, I'm, again, I'm going to say that's not my ear, so I'm not even going to answer that. So talk to with your, your GYN. In terms of the hysterectomy and keeping your ovaries, you have your ovaries, so you have the risk of having ovarian cancer, which is one in 78. Um, so, you know, I always say if you still have your ovaries, make sure you still see your GYN because I unfortunately see a lot with patients who had their hysterectomies 30 years ago and know that ovary has given them some issues and present. So we've seen it a lot of times. Okay, so make sure that somebody's still doing a pelvic exam to make sure they're not getting abnormal or if you're having pain that you get a pelvic ultrasound to make sure they're fine, okay? And then here's a question. Do you recommend BioT treatments? What is recommended for vaginal dryness? I, again, this is benign GYN and I'm not up to date with this, so I cannot answer. Okay. And then here's uh, another question. I had fibroids and have endometriosis and adomyosis. Are my chances of having children slim to none? Um, well, I'm going to say with Endometriosis. So endometriosis is where whenever you have a period, there's a um, shedding of the lining of the uterus and it goes up through the cervix and into the vagina and you have a period. Well, sometimes that lining can go into the fallopian tube and gets backed up in the ovary or within the abdominal cavity. That causes a lot of inflammation and scarring and scars the tubes. So if the tubes are scarred, then the ovaries can't, um, when they release the egg, the egg doesn't go through. So that's why it's difficult to get pregnant. Um, I wouldn't say slim to none. You know, I think God is the one who is in charge of that. And I've seen a, a, a plethora of a, a millions of people. I haven't seen them, but you, you hear all the story. They told me I couldn't get pregnant. Then I had twins. So I am never one to tell somebody you can never get pregnant. Okay. Um, that's for the Lord, but sometimes endometriosis can increase your risk of having a clear cell or an endometrioid cancer. Okay. Um, very rare, you know, but sometimes it can, those things can be the precursor. And it said, what if your tubes were tied before you before had you a hysterectomy. Can you still get ovarian cancer is the question. Yeah, you can still get, because there's still some ovarian cancers that start what we call de novo in the ovary rather than at the tube. So yes, the ovaries are still there. You can still develop it. Dr. Davis, we have um, two questions from YouTube viewers. Oh, sure. That you haven't covered, I don't think yet. Um, one is, do OBGYN doctors get trained in removing fibroids non-surgically? Uh, this individual asked because she thought it's something that a radiologist would normally do. Yeah, so um, so we have different options. So typically OBGYNs are trained into giving you different options. We are trained surgically, but interventional radiology, which is a radiologist, they have found a way in packing those blood vessels with these little particles, okay, that reduces the blood supply. So it's not that we're not, we're trained in, in um, treating it, like giving you hormones, different things like that, but there's another specialty that, you know, figured out that they can also treat it. And we all work together. Okay. And here's one more from YouTube. It says, if I had the HPV, HPV vaccine at 12 years old, am I still protected from getting HPV cancers at 27 years old? Yes, you are. Although, um, let's see, so 12 and you're 27, they probably had a quadrivalent vaccine back then. No, they have a non-avalent, which is a nine one. So, you know, I, there's uh, some talk about getting um, 
not not almost like a booster, but getting just a, a this new series because it can protect you against more. The quadrivalent one was just six eleven, which typically gives you the benign warts in your hand and vaginal warts. And then you had the um, sixteen and eighteen, which is the most common type of HPV that causes cancer. So I certainly would, you know, if you haven't had a non-valent one, I I probably would. Okay, and that's all we have from YouTube viewers. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for joining our call. I want to thank our South Atlantic Regional uh, Division here um, and our members and everyone viewing from everywhere. And also thank, of course, Dr. Mitzi Ann Davis, Sora Angeline Jackson, Sora Nicole Adams, and of course, Sora Shabir Gatson. And please, um, if you have any additional questions or that you want answered, you can email us at info at blackhealthmatters.com. This session will be um, on YouTube, on the Black Health Matters YouTube channel, as well as on our SAR channel as well, South Atlantic Regional Conference channel as well. So thank you everyone and have a good evening.